Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. And we've been going through this series called Real and Restored Relationships. And I've been really enjoying it as I've been doing my research, as I've been learning. I'm kind of just sharing some of the input or some of the things that I feel God is speaking to me about how do we uh, find authenticity? How do we find more restoration uh, in our relationships? And so we started at the beginning of February, the month of love. We started talking about when you're single and dating, we talked about seven myths of relationships. And then uh, right after that, we did an interview with a couple in our church on marriage, which was absolutely incredible. And last week, we talked about parenting. You know, we went through what it means to train up our children. How do we actually do that in our lives? And today we're going to conclude this series and we're going to talk about friendship. Now, not all of us are single and dating. Not all of us are married. Not all of us are parents, but all of us are friends, right? We have friends, somebody you're a friend with, whether it's just online or it's in person, whatever. We all have some sort of friends in our lives. But do you know one thing I've realized as I've gone through life is we suck at being friends like we do like we suck at it like we 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 talk about like how important it is you know for connection and friendship we suck we leave our friends unread for sometimes like a month have you ever had that when when you look back and like on like facebook messenger on your phone you're like shoot they texted me literally three weeks ago and i thought i responded you know what i'm talking about that happened to me this week someone had texted me literally three weeks ago and I open up my, my, my message to them, and it's just typed out. I didn't even send send yet. They ever have that happen to you? It's so frustrating. But we are not very good at being friends. We suck at developing relationship. We suck at maintaining relationship. In fact, we even suck at talking to our friends. Sometimes we, we, we realize we haven't talked to some of our closest friends or our closest even family in a long time because we've just gotten so busy, and we've gotten so poor at friendship in our life. And I think what's happened is because we've gotten poor at it, what's happened is we have started to lose, it started to lose how important it is. Like we've started to forget how important friendship is in our lives. And so what happens is, is that we, some of us, we walk around and be like, I don't need friends. I don't, no, I don't need any friends. I, I'm good on my own. And the reality is you might be good for a season, but there's going to be a time in your life where you need to have friends in your life. And we need to have friends in our lives that are other than our spouses, we need to have friends in our lives that are other than our children. We need to have friends in our lives that aren't even related to us. And it was funny, when, when Beth first moved to Calgary, uh, she had no friends there. Right? Clearly, it's a new city. And so what happened is, is I would go hang out with my friends, and Beth would be so mad at me. She'd be like, how come you're going to hang out with your friends? She's like, I don't have friends. I'm like, then make some. And I wasn't trying to be rude, but I was like, go make some friends because I can't be your only support. Yes, I'll be one of your main supports, of course, but you need to have support outside of your relationship, outside of your marriage. You need to have friendships. We need to have people uh, to bounce ideas off of and people to share our hardships with. You know, Beth and I were talking, you know, sometimes even in marriage, one of you is going through a hard time, right? And you can be there to support each other, but what, what's really tough is when you're going through a hard thing together. Because yes, you can support each other, but you're going to need outside people to be there to support you. And this is where friends come into the picture. And our vision as a church is to make Jesus known. First and foremost, we are here to make Jesus known. But number two is we want to create a place that anyone can call home. Where we can walk into this place, no matter who you are, you can walk in here and you can feel like you're part of our family. And what this looks like for us is that those of us who do call uh, our church, known Victory Church home, those of us who call it home, our responsibility is to create the environment where people can walk in and they can feel like they can connect and they can actually build authentic and real relationships. That's what those of us who call this place home, that is part of our responsibility is create this place. Because church isn't supposed to be a place, just a place that we go. It's supposed to be a people that we love. You know, church is not just to come on Sundays, come for, you know, the hour, an hour and a half, two hours, and then go home. It's to develop relationships with one another that go outside these doors. The church is so much more than just a Sunday gathering. It's so much more than just an opportunity to come together and worship. Of course, that's a big part of it. But a lot of it has to do with actually growing and getting connected and developing relationship and creating friendships 
in church. And I look back at my life and I think some of my closest friends, some of my closest relationships are those that actually started in church. You know, I was thinking about my, in my life, when I was in ninth grade, I switched to, uh, I switched schools when I started high school in 10th grade. And it was funny because all my friends, I only have one friend still from high school, but from my junior high, Christian school days, church, you know, youth group days, so those are still some of my closest friends. The friends I went to high school with, we don't really have much relationship with. The only person who I still have relationship with from high school is someone who I invited to church and then they started serving on my team. Like, like some of my closest relationships have come from this environment of church. And I think it's really important for us to realize how important friendship is. But today I want to really talk about how do you be a good friend? Because I think we just need to start at the, bare, the basics. Like how, how do we become great friends? How is it that we can actually be good friends to each other? So I'm going to go through 10 ways to be a good friend. And we're going to be here for like two, three hours. It's a joke. Have you ever heard me talk for more than like 45 minutes? Probably not. I don't got that much to say, right? Like someone was like, hey, can you come preach at my church? I want it to be an hour. I'm like, I don't know if I'm capable of that. <laughs> like I'll try, like, but I'm going to become repetitive. And anyway, it's going to be good. Ten ways that we can be a good friend. Number one is be honest. You know, some of us, we think that honesty destroys relationships, we think if I'm truthful with you, if I tell you how you've wronged me, if I tell you your blind spots, if I tell you the things about you that are kind of annoying, that's going to be the end of relationship. That's how some of us think relationships are and friendships are, is that if we're honest, it's actually going to destroy connection. We think that if we tell the truth, it's going to hurt, and then they won't think that we love them because we've hurt them. You know, it's easier for us to hide the truth and stay close with somebody than to tell them the hard things at the cost of their relationships. This is what a lot of us think. We think that honesty is something that, it's so interesting because we, um, we all value honesty. We all do. Like Beth and I will do like premarital counseling with a couple and they go through like their top five priorities. Pretty much 90% of the time, honesty is in top five of what people want in a relationship. Yeah, we actually aren't very good at being honest. Right, it's like, it's like we don't like it. And in the Bible, in Proverbs 27, verse 5 to 6, it says this. An open rebuke is better than hidden love. And this right here. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Some of us are going through life and we're only pursuing the praise. Right? We're only going to have a relationship with people who praise us. As soon as somebody comes to us and says, hey, I see this fault. I see this in you that you can actually work on. This is something that you can grow. And we're like, no, I'm only going to pursue the praise. And so what we do is we have a relationship with people that don't love us. All they want is our attention. So they're going to give us what we want. If we want to have true and deep, real friendships, we have to learn to be honest with each other, even when it's painful. You know what? Honesty sometimes is really painful. You know, and I'm the kind of person where if you have something... If you have a whole, like, head of lettuce stuck in your teeth, I'm going to tell you. Like, I'm going to tell you. Why? Because how long have you been running around with, like, literally, like, an inch long, like, piece of meat in your mouth? And I'm like, stop. I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to tell you when your zipper's down. Because it's embarrassing. I'm going to tell you when your zipper's down. Why? Because I care about you and I love you. I'm going to be honest with you. I'd rather you get the embarrassment for me than everybody. We need to learn how to be more honest with one another in our lives. As friends, we need to learn to be honest. And not in a mean and hurtful way. Not like, you're stupid. Like, don't say that. Be like, I think that you could educate yourself more on this topic, right? That's a better way to say that. You don't need to be mean. But I'm going to tell you when there's something that's wrong because I care about you. And it's, it's interesting because oftentimes in life, when it comes to honesty, it obviously builds trust. Because if I'm willing to go to you when I see a problem, when I see an issue, that means I care deeply about you. Because a lot of us, we don't just do that with everybody. So that's how we grow in deep and real relationships. I would rather people be honest with me about my blind spots and about my mishaps and, and not me just realize it on my own. I don't want to realize it when it's too late. I would rather people tell me because being honest in relationship is really important. So that's number one. How do you be a good friend? Number one is be honest. Number two is be present. We have to actually be present in relationships to actually be there in the moment. 
I think about how many times, and I don't know if this is you as well, you know, Jane's kind of in this phase now where she starts saying, Dad, watch this. And then she does something that's like not cool, right? You know what I'm talking about? She's like, watch this. And she literally just like jumps and puts her knees on her, on like a, on like a, a, a towel. She's like, did you see that? I'm like, yeah, but I don't really know what I'm looking for. You know, like, she's like, watch this. But I think how many times, I think sometimes she's saying, watch this because of how many times I'm so distracted by my phone, I'm not actually paying attention to her. But I think that's why she's saying it. I think she's saying it because she knows that the only way to actually get me to be present is when she actually tells me to be present. Like how many times am I just wasting so many precious moments with my family or so many precious moments with my friends because I'm on my phone? Nowadays, you go out for dinner, right? And you know this. You look around, everybody, they're on dates and they're on their phone taking pics of their food and they're like not even talking. It's like, it's no wonder we're not actually having real and restored relationships. We're not even present with one another wherever we go. I can't tell you how many times Beth and I have been having sometimes a very serious conversation and I walk away mid-conversation. I, I hate, I, I don't like this about me, but she'll be talking to me about something really important and just all of a sudden, boom, I like walk away. Because I'm thinking about, wow, I think I bought some p- potato chips yesterday and I would much rather them be in my stomach than my cabinet, you know? And so I'm like, I want to get those in my stomach. And then I'm so distracted, I don't even pay attention to what Beth's saying. So I'm walking away to my cabinet as Beth is just staring at me bewildered that I just walked away mid-conversation. Because some of us were so distracted. We're so distracted that we've actually gone to a point where being present in relationship, being present in conversation is awkward and we don't like it. Because we don't know how to act when we're actually engaged in conversation. We have to learn how to be present. You know, in Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 says this, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day that his return is drawing near. We have to be present with one another. We can't just have our relationships over social media. We can't just have our relationships over, over messenger. We have to be present with each other. If we want to have real relationships, if you want to have real and authentic and transparent relationships, we have to be together. Going to each other's homes for lunch and going out for coffee and spending time in relationship. We cannot expect to develop great relationships even at church only one to two hours a week. We're not, we can't expect to have deep and real relationships with one another if the only time we see each other is one day a week and it's when we're actually in a, in, in a service. We have to get into the habit of getting together, spending time with one another, growing together, serving each other, encouraging each other. That happens in deep relationships when we are present with one another. We are much better together than we are alone, right? Because in Matthew 18, 20 says this, for where there are two or three t- gather together as my followers. I am there among them. We are more powerful together. We can accomplish more together. We are more courageous together. And we know this, but yet we still don't create habits and and time in our schedule to develop relationships with one another. We need to learn how to be more present in relationships. And number three is encourage. You know, if we want to be great friends, we have to learn how to encourage each other. You know, friends are constantly encouraging one another, encouraging each other to keep going, encouraging each other to overcome bad habits, encouraging each, other, encouraging each other to pursue our dreams, encouraging each other to face our deepest fears and face our deepest insecurities, encourage each other to love better and calling us to be the best version of ourselves. We need to be encouraging one another because we all need encouragement. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, we, I've used this verse so many times, but it's so good. It says, so encourage each other and build each other up, just as you are doing. I don't know if you have anyone in your life that any time you have a conversation with them, you just feel so encouraged. Like all they are is like a, a, a courage person. Where it's like you go and you're just in their presence. They might not even say anything. You leave, you're like, I'm the best. I'm so smart. I'm the best cook. I know people where I cook for them and it's like, and I don't cook a lot. Like I'm not the best cook, but I'll cook for them. Mostly my mom. She's like, Dustin, this is the best 
food. I love this. And it's like, you're only saying that because I cooked it for you and you don't want to be rude. You know what I mean? Like, relationships, you have to be honest, mom, right? But you have people like that in your life. I think that as believers, really, this is what we should be known for by how we encourage one another. I think a lot of the time as believers, we're known for what we're against rather than what we're for. And I think we need to learn to be known for what we are for. And we are for each other. We want to encourage each other as we keep going forward to encourage one another to keep going, to face our fear, to face our insecurity, to to pursue our dreams, to pursue our passions, to follow Jesus. Like we need to be in the habit of encouraging people. Let us be people that when people come into our presence, they leave better than when they came in. Let, let us be people where they come in, they talk to us, and they leave excited about the future, where they feel excited and they have courage inside of them to actually go forward. That's number three. Number four is to be great friends, we have to listen well. We are horrible listeners. You know, have you ever had this? Some, you share a problem with someone, hey, you know, I'm struggling with this. And then all of a sudden they just, they just start sharing their opinion and share a story with you that has nothing to do with your problem. You know what I'm talking about? You're like, hey, I just got laid off. They're like, yeah, when I was a kid, my dog died. Do you know how much that hurt? I'm like, probably did, bro, but it's been like 20 years. And I'm struggling right now. Can you just listen? It's like, no, but his name was, his name was Alfredo. That's the only name I got in my mind. His name is Alfredo. He was just this white <laughs> dog. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> but you have this? Or it's like, I, all I need you to do in, in, in relationships, you're married, you know, is, I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to listen. How many times have we heard that and we still don't listen? We're like, here's my opinion. And like, I do not care about your opinion. Go post it on Facebook. They probably care more than me. And they don't care. We suck at listening. We have to be quick to listen and slow to anger. Listen before you speak. Galatians 6.2 says this, share each other's burdens. And in this way, obey the law of Christ. I believe you cannot share each other's burdens if you're not willing to listen. Because you don't even know what you're sharing. Like, it's like, I want to have a relationship with you. And they're like, hey, this is my problem. I'm like, I'm not willing to listen to that. That's hard. Because you know what happens is we as human beings, we go through extremely hard things. Like very hard things. And for all of us, it's different. It might not be the same. It might be health. It might be money, whatever it is. But we all have our own problems. And if we're not ready to listen to one one another, it's going to be painful. Because as a family, as a church, we can carry each other's burdens better than we can by ourselves. Like we can carry our burdens better together. Why? Because yes, there's a lot more burden, but there's also a lot more people. And so some of us are going through life And we're not willing to listen to what other people are going through because we feel, I don't think I can carry that weight as well. Because there's a lot of very hard things that we have to carry. And we have to get way better at actually listening, carrying that weight, but also sharing the load. Sharing it amongst one another because you are not created to carry it all by yourself. We bear one another's burdens by listening intently. You don't have to do anything. We carry it by being willing to listen and ready to carry the weight with them. You might not even have to say anything. But just your presence with them is enough to lift them, to encourage them, to lift their spirits. Just your presence and listening in it. Listening stops us from comparing and teaches us compassion. Compassion is us sharing our thoughts. Our comparison is us sharing our thoughts, sharing our opinions, sharing our ideas. But compassion is sitting with people and learn, learning to understand their pain. You know, I want to give you a quick tip to learn how to listen better is rather than give answers, ask questions. If you want to listen better, don't just give answers, ask questions. To understand more about what it is that they're going through. How can I understand deeply what you're going through? How can I get it? How can I understand it? That's a one b- way. If you want to learn how to listen better is stop answering them and start asking them. Ask them to get deeper into it. Understand their problem by asking questions to gather more information. Number five is we have to be generous. And know being generous grows relationships more than you know. I'm sure you've had a moment in your life that's extremely hard, as we all have. We've all had moments where we get a diagnosis or we get laid off or whatever it is we can't afford to buy groceries. Like there's so many things that are really, really hard. And you remember when someone was there for you in that moment. 
You know, this week for Beth and I, we had some challenges, Beth and I. You know, as Beth gets closer to uh, our next baby being born, which is coming so fast. As Beth gets closer, obviously she needs to start resting more. And so what, what this means is that in our lives, we're very busy as a lot of us are. We're busy humans. And so what ends up happening is it seems that our home becomes, uh, war zone's the wrong word, uh, chaos, yes. Toys everywhere, books everywhere. Like it gets pretty crazy. And it's sometimes hard for us to keep up. Like it's hard for us to just keep up in normal life because of how much is going on. And you know, this week we were blessed as two families cooked us meals this week and came and brought it to our house. We had someone come yesterday and help us clean our house. And we didn't ask. I didn't ask anyway. And people just came and started supporting us. And I think we all need to have people who will be there for you when you can't do it by yourself. And again, in marriage, in relationships, it's it, when one of you is the one having the struggle, it's a little different. But when both of you are in the midst of the chaos, that's when you definitely need some support from the outside. We need to be generous with one another. We needed friends this week, and we were blessed to have some right around the corner to support us when things were tough. We were so blessed by that. And my heart is that those of us who are going through similar things, that we can find the same support that Beth and I found. And then John 15, 13 says this, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for his friends. If you want to learn how to be more generous, this is it. Lay down your will. Lay down your right. Lay down your finance. Lay down your time. Lay down your opinion. Lay down your fear. Lay down your life. I think this is the deepest place of connection and authenticity we can get is when we're willing to lay down our lives. So lay it all down for one another. That's the greatest form of love. You know, the laying down of our lives for other people. We all need people to be there for us, to give us their time, to give us their skills, to give us their money, to give us their support. There's all moments where we have hard moments. But we need to be willing to do the same. You know, great friends um, lay down their lives for each other. Even if it's a sacrifice, even if it's painful, even if it's hard, even if it's exhausting, we need to learn how to lay down our lives for one another. Number six is be loyal. Now, I think we have lost the, lo the art of loyalty in our culture. You know, when a job comes along that we think will fulfill us better, we jump at it right away, even if it isn't, even if it isn't best for us or even if it's not best for our family. It's, it seems better. And so we are always pursuing the more rather than being content. And so we've actually lost the art of loyalty. We think that if only I had a new job, then I will finally be happy. You know, we, we see a better looking person come along and we try and sneak our way into their lives and leave our previous partner, then I will be happy. And so we've actually lost this art of loyalty in our lives. You know, gr but great friends are loyal through thick and thin. And Proverbs 17 says this, 17, 17, a friend is always loyal and a brother is born to help in a time of need. You know, loyalty keeps the problems in front of us. Because what it does is, is if we just, if we've gotten so good at quitting, and this is our culture, we've gotten so good at quitting, is that when we quit, why? Because it's hard. Because, we're, whatever it is. We quit because it's hard. And what loyalty does is it actually keeps the problems right face to face with us. And we have to actually go after the problems. That's what loyalty does in our lives. And we shift from a space of quitting to a place of loyalty by realizing that oftentimes comfort is a disease that our character is susceptible to. We want to grow our character. Let's be loyal. Let's be loyal at work. Let us be loyal at church. Let us be loyal with our family. Let us be loyal with our friends. Let us not just find the better friend because they're more skilled or they can offer me more or they can finally finish my basement for me. Like, like we need to have friends even if they don't, can't offer you anything. Even if you're the one pursuing them. Loyalty is what we need to do because loyalty builds courage so we can face the hard things dead, dead on. That even when things are difficult, we are steadfast and we're faithful. To keep pursuing, to keep going forward. That we give up on the temptation to quit. We don't give in to the voices that say we can't do it. And we realize that our future is built by how we respond to life's hardest moments. Loyalty is so key in relationship. And number seven is relate. You know, we are good friends when we can learn to relate to people who have different interests, hobbies, and passions than us. 
And I've shared this before, but some of the best parenting advice I ever got was learn uh, what your kids love and learn to love it too. And I think it's the same in, in life. You know, if you want to, you know, grow in relationships, find out what your friends are, in, are enjoy and learn to love that as well. You know, you might not be super into going to the mountains and hiking, but maybe your friend is like, well, I'll try, you know. Don't take me on a hard one though. Because I, I want to survive the day. I want to make it through. I don't want to fall off a cliff. Right? Like we need to learn how to, how to relate to one another. And in 1 Corinthians 9, 20 to 22, this is Paul. He's talking, this is really about evangelism. But I think it's really key to just relationship. But he's talking about sharing the gospel. He says, when I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under the law. Even though I'm not subject to the law. I did this so that I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so that I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try and find common ground with everyone, doing, even, doing everything I can to save some. And I think, again, this is in the context of sharing the gospel. But I think even in, in, in life, this is the way it is. We have people in our life who are going through weak moments and some of us, we're not willing to step out of our, of our strength to step into their weakness. We're not willing to, 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 to put our lives on hold. We're not willing to lay down our lives for our friends, right? Because they're weak or they're struggling. It's like, no, I don't got time for that. I'm busy. I got all this going on. We need to learn how to relate with, to one another and be close with one another and love one another and actually enjoy each other's presence and enjoy each other's company. And if, if you're in a relationship, I know that, you know, even for Beth and I, there's a lot of things in our relationship that are passions for her that she really enjoys. And for me, I could care less. Right, like, like I just don't really care. But what I'm trying to do and I'm trying to learn is how can I relate to her so that we can actually connect over this. Some of us were lacking intimacy and connection in our relationships because we're not willing to learn how to love what they love. We're not willing, we're like, no, I want you to do this with me. It's like, no, learn how to love what they love as well. That's how you're gonna grow and relate to one another better. And the number eight is this, have their back. How you talk about your friends when they aren't in the room is important. How you let people talk about your friends when they aren't in the room is really important. Proverbs 18, 24 says this, there are friends, I love it's in brackets, who destroy each other, but a real, fr a real friend sticks closer than a brother. There are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. How you talk about your friends when they aren't in the room is really important. If you wanna have deep and real relationships, our job is to honor one another, whether they, they're even listening or not. To actually honor one another, to have each other's back, to be there for each other through thick and thin. When someone's talking trash about our friend, we step in and say, no, this is my friend, I love them. This is what's best about them. We need to protect each other. You know, when they go into, into uh, when we go into relationships, this is exactly what it needs to be. And I think so many times trust is broken in relationships because we're not there to support each other. We're not actually there when someone's talking bad about our wife. We're not like, no, I'm gonna stand up for her. Like we need to learn how to have each other's back no matter what. And the number nine is this, is reach out. You know, one of the biggest regrets people have in their life is not reaching out for fear of it being awkward. And more often than not, they're feeling the exact same way. And you know, in my life, one of my biggest regrets is not reaching out and spending time with my grandfather before he passed away. And I think a lot of the time we, you know the saying, right? You never know what you got until it's gone. That's one of my biggest regrets in my life. I think all of us, we can look back at how many times we wish we would have reached out. We wish we would have just sent the text message or we wish we would have made the phone call because we find out later the bad news and we've kind of felt this prompting even just before, hey, I should talk to them. Hey, I should reach out. And so some of us, we, we're not willing to reach out because we're like, what if they don't want to talk to me? You know, things are kind of weird. It's been like two years. Like, I don't really want to reach out to them. But I think we need to learn how to reach out first. Philippians 2, 4 says this, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. We have to learn to reach out even when we feel the prompt because we don't know if maybe that's Holy Spirit speaking to us. You know, I've heard so many stories of, uh, of people, you know, feeling, hey, I should reach out to this person. I haven't talked to them in like two years and then they give them a phone call and they're like, yeah, you know, tonight I was planning on ending my life. 
So I just needed somebody to reach out and be there for me and be present with me. I want to encourage you. Let us reach out. I would rather reach out and someone be mad that I reached out than not reach out and find out the bad news. Let us learn how to reach out. Spend time taking our time, taking our energy to reach out to the people that we know are struggling and not just think that what they're posting on social media is weird. Let us reach out. Let us love each other by reaching out. And then the last, the last way that we can be a great friend is this, is pray. You know, and we, I think <laughs> as believers, I think we, we've gotten into this really bad habit of saying, I'll pray for you. And then not praying. Right? It's like, hey, I'm praying for you. It's like, no, you're not. And the only person who knows that is you, right? Because I do this, and, and I'm really working on myself to not just say that. I think sometimes it's like, I'll pray for you. It's almost in some ways like I was saying, you can deal with it on your own, and you know God's going to help you rather than us stepping in. But I think for all those of us who have followed Jesus, when we say we're going to pray for somebody, we better pray for them. We better not just use, hey, I'm going to pray for you, and then when it's midnight and we realize we haven't prayed for them yet, we do a three-second prayer and then go to sleep. Like, we need to be praying for each other. Like, if I say I'm going to pray for you, I really hope that I'm actually going to pray for you. Because we can't just say, I'm praying for you, and then do nothing. You know what? When there's like a natural disaster, I know you've, you've seen this. You've seen this all the time. Um, when there's like a natural disaster and something happens, you always see on social media, thoughts and prayers, right? My thoughts and prayers are with you. My thoughts and prayers are with you. Yet our thoughts are on our schoolwork and our prayers are on our own problems. We're saying, hey, my thoughts are with you. Kind of. Well, it's because when I turn on the news, that's what I see. My thoughts are on it. Of course, I'm seeing it. But when the, the visual is gone, our thoughts aren't there anymore. Our prayers aren't there anymore. And I think we need to get better at praying for each other. If we want to be great friends, we need to pray for each other. And sometimes this means when someone's having a conversation with you, be like, hey, I'm struggling. Hey, this is hard. This is a struggle for me. Rather than say, hey, I'll be praying for you, actually pray for them in the moment. Like, hey, I'm actually praying for you. Can I pray for you right now? Even if it's somebody that maybe doesn't follow Jesus yet, like, hey, how can I pray for you right now? And then remind yourself to pray for them. Maybe that's setting reminders in your phone to say, hey, you know, you know every two hours, hey, little alarm, boom, I'm gonna pray for you. We need to get better at praying for each other. And you might ask why. This is what it says in James 5, 16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that, so that you may be healed. If you want to see restoration in your relationships, if you want to see restoration in your marriage, if you want to see restoration in the relationship you have with your kids and you have with your parents, let prayer be the starting point. Let prayer be how we start the healing process. Let prayer be what it is that we say, hey, I'm going to pray for you. And be praying for each other. You know, one thing that we do is we pray, and we get Jane to pray uh, every night before she goes to bed. And we, it's, it's always really simple. We're like, hey, we started with like, hey, uh, thank you, Jesus, for, and she tells us what she's thankful for. And sometimes she's like, pizza, my dog, my babies, right? She's got like 100 babies, by the way. It's kind of like weird. But like, it gets me excited because we're having a baby, and I'm like, Please do not treat this baby like you treat your babies. Dad, catch, like full on. Like, dad, catch, throws the baby. I'm like, if that's real, like I'm, <laughs> anyway, I, I, that's what I think about it. It kind of freaks me out. Um, but she's praying. And we're teaching her how to pray. And it's simple. It's not, it's not complicated. But we want to teach her to pray. And we want to teach each other how to pray, and we want to be praying for one another. Healing comes through prayer, and prayer has the power to produce wonderful results. Prayer produces miracles. Friendships that have been torn apart can be restored, and I've shared some of this before, but when, when, Beth, um, when Beth got pregnant with Jane, our first baby, um, you know, uh, she, we found out she was pregnant in the, in the fall, about November, of 2019. And we're really excited, right? You know, we're going to be sharing this experience with our family and our friends. 
And how many know 2020 didn't allow us to share a lot with our family and friends? And so it was some of the most lonely moments we ever had, Beth and I together, was the summer when Jane was born, which is find so fascinating and so interesting that a time that was, you know, still was beautiful, don't get me wrong, but it was really hard. We had a lot of people that we thought would be there for us. They weren't. The people that we thought would be there as we were struggling, as we were struggling being new parents, as we were struggling with our mental health, as all these things were coming up, it was really, really challenging. And the people that, that we didn't think would be there ended up being the ones who were there. The people who said, hey, I'm praying for you, and then they'd show up with a meal. They wouldn't just say, you know, prayer, I think we need to take action with our prayer. Not to say I'm praying for you. But if God is speaking to you, hey, do this, do it. Like, just bring them the meal or whatever it looks like. It doesn't have to be hard. You know, one, of the, one thing that, connect, that can connect the most distant of hearts is prayer. And we really experienced this during this moment. Where we were so lonely, we were so broken. Yet people said, hey, I'm praying for you. And then they actually came through. Prayer is powerful. Prayer can produce miracles. I really want to encourage you, let us be praying for one another. Let you be praying for us as your pastors too. Like be praying for us as we pray for you. So I want to just recap really quickly the 10 ways to be a good friend. And there's way more, but number one is be honest, be present, encourage, listen well, be generous, be loyal, relate, have their back, be the first to reach out and pray for them. Those are the 10 ways. And if we want to find authenticity, if we want to find restoration in our relationships, I think this is how we do it. We have to be less concerned about changing other people and become more concerned about changing ourselves. So many of us in our relationships are so concerned. It's like, you got to be different. You got to act different. It's like, work on yourself first. Like, are you reaching out? Are you generous? Are you praying? Are you present? Are you honest? Let us grow to be great friends. And if we learn to be great friends, I think we're going to learn to have great friendships. Let us be concerned about changing ourselves over other people. More concerned about how we love and how we care. I think it's so important when it comes to our relationships and I think really, again, the point of this whole thing was how do we find a way to find more authenticity? How do we find a way to restore the most broken of relationships? Because I think we all have broken relationships in our life that are really hard. And I really want to encourage you, really, if we boil it down to one thing, if you want to have better relationships, is pursue Jesus with everything that you have. Pursue him with all that you are. The closer you are to Jesus, the better father you're going to be. The closer you are to Jesus, the better spouse you're going to be. The closer you are to Jesus, the better boss you're going to be. The better employee you're going to be. The better person you're going to be. The closer you get to Jesus, the more generous and the more honest and the more present you will be. Because as we follow him, he's going to lead us into places that might be terrifying, but they're the most beautiful places we could be. Pursue Jesus with everything that you are, and I truly believe you will start to find restoration in your relationships. You will learn to find authenticity in your relationships. So let's pray. I'm gonna encourage you to stand, actually, uh, right now. And I want you to think about, in your life, maybe a relationship that is in turmoil or a relationship that might be broken, a relationship that's maybe on the rocks or a relationship that is Rocky. <laughs> On the rocks, Rocky. Classic. But I want you to think about it. What is a relationship that you are struggling with right now? And It might be something new. It might be something that's recent. But it also might be something that's been going on for a long time. Some of us might even be decades of broken relationship. I want to encourage you that as we pray, in your own mind, in your own heart, be praying as well. So Father, we come before you with our broken relationships even just on our minds and on our hearts right now. And God, we ask that first of all, uh, you make us humble in it all. God, I pray that you 
are our, you are our restorer, that you will restore the most broken of relationships. So God, we just pray for your peace. We pray for your protection. We pray for your love. We pray for your joy to come back into our relationships. God, I thank you that you are guiding us, you're leading us. God, give us patience. As sometimes healing takes time. Give us courage to say the right things, to say the things that might be hard to say, to be honest. And God, help us be present. Help us push past distraction and focus on relationship. God, today we just lift these relationships to you. So God, we say your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will in our relationships, your healing in our relationships, your love in our relationships, your peace in our relationships. So God, we dedicate and we give these relationships to you right now. And God, we say your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen.